Marlin and Nemo are back for more underwater adventures, and this time they're finding Dory. As always, there's an ocean of Easter eggs and hidden secrets to explore. Let's jump in! The movie starts a year after the events of Finding Nemo, but did you know that there was a 13-year gap between the two movies? In that time, talk show host and comedian Ellen DeGeneres rallied hard for another installment featuring her character, the friendly and forgetful blue tang Dory. Well, she got her wish. Not only did Pixar produce a sequel, but the story centers around her character. Another added bonus, the studio allowed Ellen to reveal the world premiere of the movie trailer on her daytime talk show. This time around, Dory is on a quest to find her parents, a journey she began way before bumping into Marlin and sort of, well, forgot about. You'll notice that her memory is actually getting a little better these days, at least where Marlin and Nemo are concerned. She doesn't have to be corrected by Marlin anymore when it comes to Nemo's name, and she even calls Marlin by name as well. Progress, am I right? As for her parents, Dory's search was originally going to find her, Nemo, and Marlin traveling to an aquatic park like SeaWorld. But the tides changed in the real world thanks to a shocking documentary that came out the same year. Blackfish was a startling film that opened audiences' eyes to the unethical and life-threatening conditions of keeping large marine animals in captivity. After the Pixar crew attended a special screening, they quickly relocated Finding Dory setting to the Marine Life Institute, a sort of aquatic study center that cares for the ecosystem and allows for the comings, rehabilitation, and goings of its marine life. The filmmakers wanted to make sure that when audiences looked back at Finding Dory 50 years after its release, it wouldn't be regarded as Pixar's Song of the South. Song of the South was a 1946 Disney film that hasn't aged well. Though it won an Academy Award for its original song Zippity Doodah, over the years its depiction of African Americans and plantation life has come to be considered racist, placing the film on the wrong side of history with regard to human rights. Obviously, Pixar hopes to stay on the right side of history concerning animal rights. Dory happens to find one sea creature that wants to exercise his right to remain in captivity, Hank the octopus. Well, Septipus, really. The story goes that he lost a tentacle in an accident involving grabby kids. But did you know that in reality the animators created his body separate from his limbs? When they combined the elements, they realized they couldn't fit an eighth tentacle without a lot of extra work, so they just left it off. It's almost as if history was repeating itself. Back in 1955, it came from beneath the sea wowed audiences with its giant octopus, created by stop-motion special effects legend Ray Harryhausen. Due to practical and budgetary limitations, his octopus only had six arms. Hank is portrayed with grumpy gusto by Ed O'Neill of Married with Children and Modern Family fame. He's on a search of his own, scouring the Institute's quarantine for an orange tag that will be his ticket to a Cincinnati aquarium and the sweet life of solitude. Did you know that some of Hank's super sneaky abilities aren't creative license, but characteristic of a real-life octopus? Octopuses, yes, that is the proper English plural of octopus, are highly intelligent animals and escape artists that can change their color and shape to either escape predators or scare them off by mimicking other dangerous animals. This is what makes it so hard to keep them in captivity. Cunning, right? Turns out Ed O'Neill has a cunning streak of his own. He and director Andrew Stanton decided to capitalize on Hank's shape-shifting abilities for grins and giggles. The two are featured in a short video where they reveal that Hank is actually the oldest and most coveted Easter egg ever created by Pixar, claiming he's even hiding in their first feature animated film, Toy Story. It bears mentioning that the video was released on April 1st, 2016. So don't let them fool you. Dory certainly gets fooled by a loudspeaker which sets in motion her rescue and quarantine at the Institute. The voice over the system is no secret. She introduces herself as Sigourney Weaver. Yes, the Sigourney Weaver, from both the Alien and Ghostbusters series. -es. This actually marks her second Pixar film. You may remember her voice aboard the Axiom in Wally. -E. As exciting as it is for American audiences to hear her voice, did you know that internationally the voice and name were changed to well known figures of the region? For instance, in the Spanish version distributed in Mexico, Weaver was replaced by Dr. Rodolfo Neri Vela, a scientist and astronaut who worked with NASA. Wow, talk about a flex! In Sweden, the voice was done by animal expert Jonas Wallström. Jonas happens to own the aquarium at Skansen, Stockholm's famous outdoor zoo. He also owns a sushi restaurant. Um, from ocean to plate, I guess. Moving on. In Germany, the intercom voice is narrated by former world-class swimmer Franziska von Almsic. And over at the boot of Italy, 
TV personality Licia Colo, famous for hosting animal and nature shows, received the honor. I wonder if Licia's expertise had her scratching her head regarding some of the artistic license taken in the movie, especially where characteristics of the sea life are concerned. Let's start with the biggest, most obvious one right off the bat, Dory's memory. Did you know that Dory's short-term memory was inspired by the belief that goldfish only have a three-second memory? It makes for an interesting character trait and plot device, sure, but number one, it's kinda strange, giving her a trait from a different kind of fish, and two, there's no credence to this fact whatsoever. It's just one of those legends that has endured for generations all over the world. In actuality, scientists have concluded that goldfish are surprisingly intelligent fish and have memories that span months to even years. What's more interesting, the data has been around to support these findings since as early as the 1950s. Still, Dory's triumph over her condition makes for a story that tugs at the heartstrings, doesn't it? You know what, let me follow this tangent for a minute. Dory has short-term memory loss, Nemo has an underdeveloped fin, Destiny, Dory's whale shark friend voiced by the hilarious Caitlin Olsen, is extremely nearsighted. The also hilarious Ty Burrell plays Destiny's neighbor Bailey, who's a beluga whale with a head injury, and Becky the loon, who helps Marlin and Nemo get into the institute, seems to have a few social and cognitive delays. The movie is set at an aquatic center focused on rehabilitation, and all these animals overcome their respective challenges for the greater good of their fellow fish. Tugs at the heartstrings? Heck yeah! Like a kite in a tornado. But I digress. As I was saying before, there's another animal in Finding Dory whose character design underwent a slight artistic adjustment or two. In an earlier sequence in the movie, Marlin, Nemo, and Dory arrive in Morro Bay after a bodacious current ride with everyone's favorite sea turtles, Crush and Squirt. Failing to heed the rest of the local sea life's warnings, they find themselves face to face with a giant squid. We first see the squid's huge eye, followed by its beak. Take a look at that beak for a second. Sure, there's nothing that looks abnormal about it, but experts would tell you that the beak is upside down, as giant squids have an underbite, not an overbite. However, maybe the squid itself is an easter egg, as it turns out it's not the only giant squid in a Disney movie to have this particular characteristic. Check out the squid in Disney's 1954 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and you'll see that Captain Nemo and his men square off with a giant squid that has the same overbite. Also, check out the way the squid lights up, all terrifyingly beautiful like it's from Planet Pandora and Avatar. Believe it or not, this may also be inaccurate. Don't get me wrong, squids can change color like our dear friend Hank, but they don't have photophores, the light-producing organs that would give them the ability to light up like a Christmas tree. Nah, they more than likely change between shades of red and white, but when light does hit them, they give off a gold or silver sheen. A fact realized thanks to a filmed expedition in 2013 by Dr. Sunimi Kubodera. Ooh, shiny! Speaking of, what could be shinier than red hot lava? I know, I know, it's a stretch, but hey, I had to segue this next Easter egg somehow. When Dory meets Hank in quarantine, pay special attention to the wider shots as Hank tries to convince Dory to give him her tag. Be on the lookout for a mini fridge with a magnet on it that says UKU. Look closely and you'll see a volcano on the magnet. This little Easter egg is referencing a sweet Pixar short called Lava, about a volcano who sings a song of love in the hopes of one day having someone to share it with. What does UKU stand for? Well, the entire story is sung and the singers are accompanied by ukulele music. The first three letters of ukulele are UKU, which is the name of the first volcano, Yuku. Can you guess the name of his true love? You got it, Lele. Eventually, Dory does wind up giving Hank her tag, and when she does, you might need a magnifying glass to catch this super tough Easter egg. You can see it best in the wide shot when Hank takes the lid off the plastic cup while hanging over the open ocean exhibit. You're looking for a bulletin board on the right side of the frame, and on it is a calendar which reads Wall E. It's a little tip of the hubcap hat to everyone's favorite waste allocation load lifter. From one hunk of metal to another, let's hitch a ride on the truck bound for the Cincinnati Aquarium. When Hank slaps down on the windshield, watch closely as the front of the truck comes to a screeching halt. Did you happen to get that license plate number? C-A-L-A-113? C-A-L as in Cal Arts, A113 as in the Pixar animator's classroom number and beloved Easter egg. Always a good feeling finding that one. Dory decides the best path between land and water is a straight jump off a hill. So she has Hank gun it off the edge and we're treated to a gravity-slowed ballet of exotic fish raining into the bay 
as the truck careens into the ocean. During this slow motion sequence, pay close attention to the police force on the bridge, especially the mustachioed aviator wearing cop standing with his hands on his hips. This one's a little naughty, not because of his hips, no, because of his lips. See if you can guess what he's saying. The shot cuts away before the final word, but it looks like he's mouthing what the f fish. I'm sure that's it. I'm sure he said fish. You know, there are a few more fish worth mentioning. In fact, a whole crew from Finding Nemo that, until the very, very end of the movie, go unaccounted for. Talking about the gang from the dentist's fish tank. If you recall, the last time we saw them, they had implemented Gil's escape plan and found themselves safely in the ocean, but still in their plastic baggies. Well, it appears not much has changed as they float past the sea lion's fluke and rudder. Their bags are filthy thanks to the passage of time. All the bags, that is, except for Jacques. Sweet touch, Pixar. Rumor has it that if there's another film in the Finding series on its way, the story might just revolve around saving these guys. If we're on a 13-year timetable, expect the next one in just a few short years. In the meantime, why don't you fish for some more hidden secrets and easter eggs in Finding Dory? Check out our video, Did You Know These 34 Finding Dory Facts, right now. I hope you liked this video and found some cool new details you haven't seen before in Pixar's Finding Dory. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and easter eggs.